Faculty of Architecture at SEPT University. And a warm welcome to you, Martha Schwartz, our speaker this evening, who is, of course, an uh, internationally well-known and acclaimed uh, landscape architect, and whom I first heard of when I was working in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> in California in the 80s. And now I would like to request uh, Chandrani, Chandrani Chakrabarti, Program Coordinator for the Masters in uh, Landscape Architecture at SEP, and who arranged this talk for us to introduce Martha to our audience. I might switch off my microphone because of the dog. <laughs> Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yagnik. Uh, so good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, good morning, Martha. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Okay. So uh, today, Martha has uh, joined us to uh, give a talk on climate change and why we need geoengineering. And just to, I mean, no, she doesn't need an introduction, but just for the greater audience beyond landscape who has joined today um, across from the university, Martha Schwartz is a landscape architect, urbanist, and a climate activist. Uh, her work and teaching focuses on urban public realm landscape and its importance in making cities climate ready. For more than 40 years, Martha Schwartz and her firm have completed projects around the globe from site-specific art installations to public spaces, parks, master planning and reclamation. She is now engaged in strategic land use and landscape planning in assisting leadership in their participation and preparation for the effects of climate change that their cities will face in near future. She is a tenured professor in practice at Harvard University Graduate School of Design and is the founder and the participant of the GSB Climate Change Working Group, which gave shape to the first ever required climate change course to the incoming students in 2020. Um, she also has uh, mounted a seminar in conjunction with uh, Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science on the topic of geoengineering. She is the founding member of a working group of uh, sustainable cities at the Harvard University Center for the Environment, uh, a founding member for the Landscape Architecture Foundation's working group on climate change. And she has recently founded uh, Mayday.Earth, a nonprofit organization uh, that is focused on educating non-scientists and generalists about geoengineering and global scale solutions, which can be integrated in the practice. Uh, awarded as, uh, you know, 2020 ASLA Design Medal, uh, Ms. Schwartz is the recipient of numerous international recognitions, including the Honorary Royal Designer for Industry Award from the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce for her outstanding contribution to the UK design, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the Women in Design Award for Excellence from the Boston Society of Architects, an honorary doctor from the University of Ulster in Belfast, uh, Ireland, uh, a fellowship from Urban Design Institute, visiting residences as Radcliffe College and the American Academy in Rome, and an honorary fellowship from REBA, the Council of Fellows Awards by ASLA, and most recently, Dr. Honoris Causa from the Boston Architecture College. So really a very, very warm welcome to you, Martha, uh, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Chandrani. Um, I don't know, it's always kind of painful to hear all that stuff. It just makes me feel very old, but, uh, but thank you for the lovely introduction. Okay, um, I'm gonna to try to do my best to pack as much information as I can. Um, uh, but uh, I may have to skip pieces if I'm running out of time, okay? So let me get up to share screen. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing, okay, no? There we go, okay, here we go. Where do I go, here we go. So, share. Oh yeah, share. Okay. Ta da! Can you hear? Can you see it? Beautiful. Okay. 
So um, this is a too long title, which is going to be for too long um, lecture. It's about climate crisis, uh, ideas about what we can do as uh, prof uh, you know, professionals within the built environment. And then lastly, why we will need geoengineering. I used to say why we may need geoengineering, but over the last half year, it's gone to why we will need geoengineering and especially a country like India will need it uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll talk a bit why when, when we get there. So uh, the climate crisis is here. We are now at 1.1 degrees from the pre-industrial average global temperature. Um, uh, it's a global problem, however, uh, effects uh, depend on where we are. So wherever you're looking at or designing or going to, you have to really research uh, your specific uh, piece of the world to really figure out what you need to do. So um, I guess all of you are certainly aware of the IPCC. And all the countries committed under the Paris Agreement pledged their best effort to limit increases in global warming to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. Uh, and then the 2015 IPCC report came about at the request of several small island nations who asked them for further study of a lower threshold, knowing that they would be one of the very first who would actually lose their, their home and their islands by uh, sea level rise. So um, this data, this is very, <clears throat> sorry, this is a very important one because it shows us the difference between a half a degree. So in the left column, it's 1.5 degrees centigrade and the other one is two degrees. And it's important to understand that as the temperature goes up, it, it's not linear. It's not a linear process. Um, and you can see from um, the extreme heat, that at 1.5, the percentage of heating is 14%, but at two degrees, it's 37%. So it goes up um, over uh, 100%, just in half a degree. And when you're looking at the issue of degrees, you have to think how much energy would you have to use in order to uh, heat up the oceans one degree. It would take a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to actually make the whole earth system heat up one degree. So then we've, we've passed the, uh, the tipping point here. We've done um, 400 uh, parts per minute, sorry, per, um, uh, yeah, parts per million. And then here we have the temperature it's a graph of global warming, and it says that we have passed the one degree, and we're now at 1.1 degree. And this means that we are at four tenths of a degree before we hit 1.5, which is not much. So climate impacts are hitting harder and sooner than prevailing that we had actually predicted. Now, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm really gonna start off talking about the global south and the global north. And um, I'm just wondering whether you guys have really discussed th this um, differentiation between north and south, but in one sense, it's a very important differentiation. And this is the biggest case of environmental inequality in the world. So the global south is in the front line of climate change. As these countries are closer to the equator, heating up there more quickly than the northern hemisphere. And the earth is heating up from the north to the south. The, um, yeah, the idea of categorizing the global north, north and south uh, by their economic and developmental status began during the Cold War. And the nations of the north tend to be wealthier, less unequal, more technologically advanced, and considered more democratic with one quarter of the world's population, 25%, the North controls four fifths of the income earned anywhere in the world. 
And as nations become economically developed, they may become part of the defin definition of the North. The Southern states are generally poorer developing countries with younger, more fragile democracies and heavily dependent on primary sector exports and frequently share a history of past colonialism by the Northern states. So nevertheless, the divide between the North and the South is often challenged and said to be increasingly incompatible with reality. Actually, I find reality is more incompatible with reality these days. So let's see, let's go back. So um, between 2009 and 2018, 71 million people worldwide were forcibly displaced. And this includes 41 million people who were displaced in their own country. And since 2008, climate change has forced an average of 26 million people a year from their homes. And the most vulnerable are people from the regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America, where over 140 million people could be forcibly displaced by 2050. So a heat wave killed thousands of people in India and Pakistan could soon become the norm. With the eastern India's, Indian city of Kolkata and the southern Pakistani city of Karachi, they are likely the cities that are going to be affected the worst. So heat will also affect higher food prices, income losses, loss of livelihood opportunities, adverse health impacts, and population displacements. And even as now, India has the most starvation in the world. Uh, India stands to be one of the nations most significantly affected given its huge population and levels of inequality and poverty. So the scale of need is huge, really making India the concentrated center of the global water and sanitation crisis. You're at ground zero. And about 100 million people across India are on, are on the front lines of a nationwide water crisis. Groundwater, which is a very important issue, has been steadily depleting for years, and it makes up 40% of the country's water supply. Most countries, including the United States, we've drunk out our aquifers without understanding that you need to let the rain percolate into the soil to replenish them. It takes a long time to replenish aquifers. So, um, in 20. 50, the heaviest rains in decade was aggravated by the tropical cy cyclone brought and broke widespread flooding, I'm sure which you all know across the south causing more than 200 deaths and affecting 1.8 million people. And India's vulnerability is partly due to its sensitivity to a wide range of climate impacts, including droughts, floods, storms, landslides and extreme temperatures. Um, basically everything. Uh, sea level rise, this is a visualization. It's showing the major uh, global cities that are gonna be hit and the size of the circle has to do with uh, how much um, uh, econo economic loss uh, that will happen. And you can see that Southeast Asia and China are really going to be in the worst situation in terms of sea level rise. Um, we need to actually prepare for a possible two meter uh, sea level rise by 20, uh, 2100, um, and perhaps even up to six meters. And the problem is that the scientists really can't predict the behavior of the different, uh, of the different poles because they're just learning, like they've just learned now that there is warm water underneath the Antarctic that is melting away the Antarctic from the bottom. If the Antarctic actually goes, then the sea level rise is going to go up very, very quickly. So these are really quick images uh, from uh, Climate Central. That's a very good website. Um, it's a, uh, that actually enables you to see any place in the world uh, in terms of sea level rise. And uh, I, I advise you going to that site. I think it's, it's very interesting, but you can see how, um, well, you can see how terribly impacted Kolkata and, and, and Bangladesh are, because I'm sure you might know this. And this is an interesting 
uh, visualization because it's Mumbai. And fairly recently, there's been a whole new update in terms of these predictions. So you see to the left was a previous prediction. And now the more updated prediction is that there's going to be a lot more water in Mumbai. So um, floods have already done a lot of damage. Um, uh, sorry, uh, if you hear any coughing in back there, that's my dad who's 101 years old. So it's not, yeah, so just, just if you hear anything weird, that's, that's my dad. So, um, uh, so we're really uh, talking about a lot of um, issues and really starts to go into displacement, which is a very big topic that India is going to have to deal with. So of, uh, let's say this is uh, the Bolha Islands. Do I have this down here? Let's see. So all of these things are really causing major evacuations to other places. And uh, the, the amount of people uh, moving around the country and being displaced is going to be a very big topic, of course, which means that how do we as builders of the built environment really prepare for this? So in the next 50 years, Bangladesh expects to have between 25 and 30 million people displaced by the effects of climate change. And the Bangladeshis are being forced to move in order to stay above water because they have water coming down from in back of them because of the rivers and in the front as from the ocean and also the soils and is uh, subducting and sinking as many coastal cities uh, is also experiencing this. So coastal erosion associated with even stronger storms along with the encroachment of salt water onto low-lying agricultural land has caused people to lose not only their livelihoods, but their land. And the uh, in, infusion of uh, salt water into agricultural lands is a real issue. So as a result, many internally displaced peoples are flocking to the large city, such as Dhaka, in order to find refuge. And in the last 17 years alone, the number of people living in slums in Bangladesh, Dutch's cities have risen for uh, 60%. And with up to 2,000 people moving into the city every day, the city's population could double to 30 million within two decades, further increasing the pressure on DACA's informal settlements. So let's talk about social instability. When I learned about this, I uh, literally it blew my mind. Um, this is how climate change will bring about social instability because when people show up needing food and water, it's a non-negotiable. Um, ask. It will either be a life or death situation. And water supply is a huge concern in India, at, between India and China. And recently, India's water supply has suddenly surged as a result of the melting um, glaciers before it dries up, after which creating massive waves of displaced and starving people. And the conditions swing from too much water to not enough water. And this is very disruptive to agriculture and exacerbates food equity. So here's China. China is a country of extremes. The South can expect more flooding and the North is dry and drought stricken. And the monsoons will take longer to get into the dry interiors of China, which are actually expanding. And the aquifers are being pumped dry. So I'm talking about this because in relationship to India, you guys are both these two grand and very populated nations and you're both dealing with the same issues of access to water and the melting Himalayas. So here you can see that the Gobi Desert, it's the yellowish area, is, extends into Mongolia and it's one of the driest deserts on earth. And nearly 20% of China is desert and drought across the Northern region is getting worse. One recent estimate said that China had 21,000 square miles more desert than when it existed in 1975, which is about the size of Croatia. And the Northwestern deserts are merging with two other deserts to form a vast sea of sand that could become uninhabitable. Um, many villages have been lost and climate change and human activities have accelerated de desertification. And I can also say because they cut down all their forests so that they could have agriculture, 
that this um, chopping down the deserts actually caused this uh, desertification. So um, the Tibetan Plateau covers about 25% of Chinese surface and is home to the largest store of fresh water outside of the North and South Poles, feeding into Asia's major rivers, which supply water to over a billion people. And the vivid transformations on the Tibetan Plateau have important ramifications, not only for China, but also for the rest of Asia as climate patterns change across the continent and fragile communities are threatened. So the largest glaciated area outside the poles, what is called the third pole, is, um, uh, is a result of the climate change temperatures in the Tibetan Plateau, which are rising faster than anywhere else on Asia. Just like the North Pole is warming up three times faster than the rest of the world, so is the Tibetan Plateau. So, um, can I go back? Yeah, no, let me stay on that because this, this map is really important. You can see all the rivers that are, um, that actually are starting from the Tibetan Plateau. But three main rivers on the Indian subcontinent, the Indus, in the Indus Ganges, the Trump, Bama Putra, sorry, and Mekong, Yangtze, and the Yellow Rivers are all dependent upon mountain water. And the disappearance of glacial meltwaters of the Indus will have a dramatic effect on yeah. Pakistan, whose yeah. agriculture yeah. almost is almost entirely reliant on the water from the Indus. But at least a third of the huge ice fields in the Himalayas are doomed to melt with serious consequences for almost 2 billion people. Even if carbon emissions are dramatically and rapidly cut and succeed in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, the glaciers of the Himalaya ranges will have been, be, will be gone by 2100. I don't know, maybe you're all aware of that. It uh, kind of freaked me out. So recently, India's, India's water supply has had a sudden surge resulting from the melting of the ice waters and which that create massive waves of displaced and starving people due to the floods. And the conditions swing from too much water to not enough water. And this is very disruptive to agriculture and exacerbates access to food. So by 2100, the human population is expected to shoot up to 11 to 13 billion people. And at the same time, the world's, world's land mass is shrinking because of sea level rise and also because of the changes in the lands and desertification, we are getting, we're dealing with less and less land, also with the uh, growth of population. So the sea level will, sea level rise will swallow the coastlines and displace an estimated 2 billion people from their homes, according to a new analysis from Cornell. So, yeah. So, um, so let's go on to the cities and uh, how they are affected here. Because I think cities are the most, for me, those are the most important places to focus on because uh, I think by 2100, 70% of all the global population will be living in cities. So we better figure out how to deal with cities, how to deal with migrants, how to deal with uh, climate change. So why cities? Uh, cities are absolutely key to combating climate change due to their sizes and ability to change. And they actually contribute quite a lot to, uh, to climate change. And um, that's why it's very, very important to think about how we can change cities in the face of climate change because people are coming more and more to the cities as we get hotter and hotter. So um, these are some of the issues. Uh, it's kind of a quick list. I'm, you're gonna see a lot of lists. I can't describe too much of this, but these are the things that every city can, not every, but most cities are going to be dealing with. With, with sea level rise, the coastal cities, all of them will be dealing with the uh, urban heat island effect, which is probably one of the most serious issues. Air pollution, floods, droughts, food security, water security, climate migrations, and self-sufficiency. This is the list you have to use when you're really thinking about how to really re redesign a city for the future. 
So the list of solutions, there's a long list of solutions that we can deploy. Uh, the green are the green solutions, urban afforestation, which is like my favorite thing that I'm working on, green walls, urban green infrastructure and networks, emergency parks, those are the parks that have to be built. So when it gets too hot at night, uh, people can escape their buildings and get out and um, to a, a fresher and cooler environment. Regenerative agriculture, we have to relearn different and older agricultural ways to really um, be able to uh, grow our crops more efficiently and not being used pesticides and too much water. And you know, we really kind of screwed up uh, with the uh, with the way we're actually getting our food, uh, wind and albedo and ventilation corridors, and then the the black and gray ones are for the architectural folks, where we're dealing with emergent architecture, which means instead of building a whole city at once, we're going to have to go step by step because as climate changes, you're going to have to be a lot more flexible and creative in deal with um, a changing climate. Self-sufficiency is absolutely fundamental now because by 2050, countries will not be sharing their food. We're going to have to have our own food for each country. So the more you can start breaking down your cities into pieces and communities, and you can work together to actually uh, grow your own crops, figure out how to keep your own water and how to sustain your you know, smaller areas and even individual families, we're going to have to do that. Of course, renewable energy, um, transport as a service, meaning automated vehicles, uh, public transport is instead of cars and electric vehicles. So um, yeah, let's go to air pollution here. That is a very common thing um, in cities. And I'll just kind of, these are the lists of all these uh, solutions that get cobbled together in different ways to address different issues. So air pollution can be dealt with by urban afforestation, green infrastructure, urban um, smart streets, green roofs, bamboo. Um, there is now zero carbon and even negative carbon uh, concrete that is being developed, responsible sourcing for where you get your materials, recycling materials and, and design for that. Public transit has to really start working because we cannot have as many cars. And the reason is, is that we're going to need to take space in our cities in order to build landscapes of size that will cool down the cities. There's no other solution to that. So the idea of creating spaces in your streets by having public transport is a very important idea. So uh, yeah, let's go to air circulation. It's gonna to be too hot, too warm, but there are many things that can be done for air circulation. Uh, such as green walls, urban afforestation. We can land form to interrupt wind flows. Um, we can build public realm winters, wind shelters and replace paving with ground cover, wind scoops, energy placement of buildings. So there's, again, these are the, these are the um, solutions that you can bring to a city to really help with that. And food security, it will be very important for us all to figure out how we can grow as much as we can as uh, for your own food. And um, also what's very interesting is that people are working on um, high rise greenhouses, which are very, very efficient because if you pump the water up to the top, the water comes down through gravity and uses water much more efficiently. And with the heat that is coming, we're going to have to actually rely on a lot of uh, crops that are going to be grown indoors because it's going to be too hot for it, them to actually survive. So there's vertical farming, there's intercropping, we'll show a little bit about that, community gardens, urban orchards, uh, indoor hydroponic gardens, compost food waste, actually getting together as communities to be able to provide food for a community or a couple blocks or, you know, you, it's going to, Everybody's going to have to self-organize in order to provide food. And also um, you can capture, you have to capture, we'll have to capture fresh water when the rains come and keep it so that you can irrigate during the times of the droughts as well. And then you, you can compost your food waste and build soil. 
so that you can grow your own food. So you can start establishing uh, these virtuous cycles that will allow you to be more self-sufficient. So self-sufficiency is the word. Um, as I said, uh, people will not be importing or exporting food because every country is going to have to feed their own country. And one of the things is to find within your cities any space that is underutilized. Just plant them, take out the, 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 the paving and open up the soil so that the water can uh, percolate down. Uh, that can help to deal with flooding. And it also goes back to the aquifers and, and uh, nourishes the, the soil and the plants. So I'm going to go on to the urban heat island, which is a, a very important issue. Um, and that's because every city is actually going to, to need it. Hold on just a second. Um, guys, if you could not do that. <laughs> Sorry, I have a restaurant going on in back of me. Um, so cities and climate change, where am I? Okay, here I am. Yeah, so uh, the urban heat island effect is a phenomenon that actually largely impacts life in cities. And by increasing the number of extreme weather events, such as floods, droughts, and storms, and it also increases the spread of vector-borne diseases. So many cities are already turning to renewable energy sources, cleaner production techniques, and regulations or incentives uh, to limit industrial em emissions. And cutting emissions will also reduce local pollution from industries and transport, and thus will improve the air quality and health of city dwellers. And by the way, trees really help to deal with uh, air pollution. So it is considered that one of the most important climate effects has pro a profound impact on both human health and energy consumption. And perhaps the most harmful of the effects of climate change on cities. Um, I'll go back here. Yeah, so for, uh, Brian Stone, he's a professor from Georgia Tech, and he says that extreme heat tends to be more deadly than hurricanes or tornadoes or earthquakes or even all of those things combined in one year. This was a study done in the United States. And so heat is quite dangerous and deadly. Dad, I'm trying to give a lecture here. Yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. Who you, who you to my friends in India. Sorry, okay. <laughs> this is a kind of personal, you know, COVID, what can I say? So the, these effects, these are the effects of urban heat island. Uh, air quality, water quality, respiratory illnesses, children and elderly are more vulnerable. Nighttime temperatures are warmer, risk of heat stroke, use of more energy for air conditioning, which strains energy resources and stresses native plants and animal species and new vector-borne illnesses. So um, that's why I think we need to especially take a look at cities. So here are the various solutions. I wish I would have a visualization, but then we would just have, have to talk about one, one subject here. So again, if you have the basic pieces of what we can do for a city, you can cobble them together to address the different issues. I'll go through the, the uh, solutions. Now, what's interesting uh, are the causes of urban heat island effect, which happen to be the materials that we use to build the cities, urban geometry, in other words, how they're actually placed and interact with each other, uh, the heat that we generate, uh, the type of weather and geography the city is in, and also the fact that we've taken down the landscape because we didn't think it had any value which now I think we're finally understanding that that's, that's really stupid. We were, we've been really dumb. So, um, huh. yeah. <laughs> so I'm sorry, everyone, that was my dad burping. Okay. So let's talk about weather and geography. So climate change affects the weather leading to higher temperatures and longer, more severe and more frequent heat waves and urban areas are already suffering from heat island effects and they will bear the brunt of even harsher climate events. Um, so yes, the materials, so Indian cities and the buildings have a lot to do with the, what, 
how the residents feel. So the buildings play a big part in it. And materials used to construct buildings in India today are not suitable for local weather conditions. In Delhi and in several cities in North India, houses are commonly built with thin walls made of red burnt clay brick and roofs are made of concrete. And these materials absorb heat quickly and transfer some of it uh, indoors, making it hotter. And at night, these materials release stored heat outside, which makes the outdoors even hot. And that warms the air and creates unwelcome heat long after the sun is set. But hollow clay bricks and, create, and uh, concrete blocks are aerated concrete blocks store less heat than thick clay and are more suitable for hot climates. So insulating walls and using alternative building materials can also prevent indoor temperatures from climbing too high. So, and also innovative evaporative walls, natural ventilation, proper orientation of doors and windows and the use of phase change materials can also decrease a house's demand thereby diminishing the effects of urban heat island effect. So, okay, so, yeah, okay, so I skipped this. So this is a, I don't, I don't know what uh, city this is, but the idea is that when we're building or rebuilding, we have to really uh, be very careful and thoughtful about what kind of uh, materials we're gonna use because it will make a big difference in terms of uh, heat as heat rises. So the landscape materials, let's talk about landscape materials. They're a very counter, uh, important counterpart for cities. And we need materials for streets and sidewalks that are porous and not dense so that water can percolate down through the soil. And materiality can absorb, can enable cities actually to thrive despite climate threats, decrease, decrease heat, save the city billions of dollars, reduce flood risk, improve a city's livability and support health and equity. So these are all, images of, uh, uh, in, of uh, materials that are porous and can let the uh, water go down. So urban geometry, this is interesting to me that the dimensions and spacing of buildings can influence wind flow and urban materials ability to absorb and release solar energy. In heavily developed areas, surfaces and structures obstructed by neighboring buildings become large thermal masses that cannot release their heat readily. And cities with many narrow streets and tall buildings can become urban canyons, which can block natural wind flow that could bring cooling effects. So actually the relationship of how they, the geometries are and face each other is a big deal. So, okay, heat generated by us. Uh, there's a lot of heat generated by us, burning fossil fuels, cutting down global forests, farming livestock, industrial agriculture. We do a lot of things to uh, contribute to the urban heat island. So the other one is just that we've cut down all the trees so we could uh, build buildings and uh, conquer the earth and conquer the, the nature and make money off of building buildings. So we pretty much, you know, we've really taken down so much uh, uh, forestry, but um, the correlation between urban tree cover and income is well documented in cities around the world. And this is often the byproduct of historic inequality and infrastructure decisions that were made decades ago, including tree canopy for the wealthy, but not for the poor. And this continues to impact services delivered today and can be a driver of current and future inequality. So um, thinking about how to a forest or green areas of poverty is extremely important. So um, low income residents are more likely to live in hotter neighborhoods and be exposed to higher levels of air pollution, more likely to suffer heat um, impacts and the effects of stormwater flooding and green gentrification where real estate um, estate values attract new, uh, new people to move in. I mean, that's kind of a, it's a conundrum when you're a designer in the landscape to be told, don't make it so nice. And go like, oh, wait, wait, can't underserved people have beauty too? I mean, there's a big, you know, debate about that. So these are landscape based solutions to her urban heat island. Um, low income residents are more likely, as I said, to, to really suffer from those. So let's see. So how to make climate ready. I am starting with a, um, a studio that I did at the Harvard GSD in something like 2017. 
And um, the, the name of it was called Sequestropolis. Uh, we did it in conjunction with Harvard Forest. And um, it was about how we can actually uh, in, um, insert working natural systems in a city so that a city would be able to um, derive environmental benefits. So we chose Boston as our guinea pig because it's a very dense city. Um, these were our goals to ensure access to food and water, create environments that provide ecological benefits, uh, deal with water management, you know, uh, harsh storms that will be coming. We actually will have too much water in the Northeast in the United States, diminish heat loads. Sorry, can you pull this up for me? Diminish heat load effect and create livable urban environments. So the idea was to actually um, figure out how to uh, create corridors as opposed to street trees, because the life of street trees is a completely different thing than forests. Their, their forests work in a very different way. They don't have their shoes in concrete boxes and they interact as an ecosystem. So how do we actually create these really healthy and vibrant uh, true forests inside the city and it needs to be connected. You can't have piece by piece. So why is it linear? Because the roots need to connect to one another. The roots of trees are, trees are actually enabled by this symbiotic relationship between mycorrhizal fungus that coat all the roots and ha have a tremendous amount of, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a surface of their roots because they're almost microscopic, but they're very dense. And they send the water up to the trees and they send minerals in the soils. And then the trees send the um, fungus down. Uh, they, they send uh, sugars. And also they, the trees actually, this is a scientific, this is a, a data drawing of actually con the connection of trees to other trees. And forests do not like holes because holes can invite uh, pests. You could get too much rain, you could get too much sun. So forests try to rebuild areas that are damaged and they do communicate. Then the other thing is that scale matters. We have to figure out how to in, insert enough green and working green inside of cities that can make a difference to the actual environment of the city. So we have, uh, four townships within Boston uh, in red, and it's about 108 square miles with a population of close to uh, 900,000. So then we're like, okay, here's Boston. It's an old dense city. Uh, there's not a lot of space. How do we get the space? How do we actually make that space to be able to do proper forests in Boston? So um, first we looked at our um, issues about climate change in Boston. So we're gonna have stormwater overflow. We still have combined sewers. So it means that when we get too much water, the sewers back up and then you have poop all over the city and that really creates problems for human health. Um, overheating buildings, periods, and then also periods of drought, lack of open space to cool off. Uh, climate migrants are already getting within the United States. People are moving to the Northeast and Northwest um, possible epidemics, possible, I said. So uh, obviously, yes, epidemics, heat island effect, and economic environmental inequity. So the studio assumptions, we had to make assumptions because it is a, a kind of a, a future-esque idea here, is that along with the Harvard Forest, we decided that there would be no more development past the I-95 or the Yellow Ring Road so that the state would have enough area within the state so that they could farm and produce enough uh, food and water for the people within the state of Massachusetts. So this shows Boston in 2050. They have a two foot sea level rise and this was an eight foot stormwater surge. So it's a very wet MIT is, I don't know where MIT is gonna go. But what we also did is we inserted a lot of different kinds of devices within the ground, in the trenches, we would be using and planting the trees as well. And these are gonna be very important because there are two things that are working. If we were to take up everything in our streets and start it over again, we would be able to catch water when it rains and store it so you can irrigate trees 
in the dry seasons. And this was really started by Rob Adams from Melbourne, Melbourne in uh, Australia. Or you can detain water and just kind of let it seep in and then go out gradually back into the soil. So the, um, that's very important. And then taking up all the asphalt and the concrete and putting in permeable paving is absolutely in, so important because this really starts to cool down the city as opposed to just the, you know, the, 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 the water actually helps to mediate the embodied uh, energy and temperature within even these, um, these materials, but it really makes a big difference. Increasing your albedo, plant, paint all your roofs white. We actually, in our studio, we actually measured all the roofs we could paint white in Boston. Now we also figured out that by 2050, this is when it was actually looked towards to, is that uh, automated vehicles and electric vehicles would be used and that they would be used mostly as public transport and no cars. So if you take a look, the studies show that where we need maybe 12 feet to 14 feet for a person dri driven car, in an automated vehicle, it's much less. So it's eight feet. So it says, you know, basically, we can probably harvest about 25% of all streets if we were actually to rearrange the public realm from um, building face to building face. Then we planted trees that would be appropriate for that uh, area. We used uh, iTree, which is a, um, a fantastic application, which can measure all the benefits of each different species. And then each study, I'm just gonna show you one, each student had a different um, piece that they had to study and measure all the streets. The streets were determined by different typologies and then each typology had a design. So I'll just show you one, but this one is in Brookline. It's Harvard Street, it's a commercial street. So this, this is like a typical kind of commercial street. This shows the street itself. It's very, very wide. We have public transport in the middle of it. And this is, oops, sorry. So this is a section whereby we've actually taken out the street. The train is still there. We have widened sidewalks. We put in bicycle lanes and also dug away so that we had open trenches to plant these linear forests and then store the water as well and use the different um, uh, catchment ideas. So we measured this and I think this was something like, I, mean, I can't see because I don't know what the metric is here. Yeah, we saved in Brooklyn $74 million a year just in heat and energy savings because it was so cool. We didn't need as much um, air conditioning. This is one more uh, sample. This is um, in downtown Boston on Newberry Street. And to the left, it shows the existing street. And the right is kind of the first sketch about taking out the street, making it much more narrow, putting in whole forests in, in back of the alleys, and really, the and really taking a big step forward in terms of how we can really reforest the city. The lower one is the alley. So you can just you just need kind of one way cars in there and you have a whole forest where you just had asphalt. And then the top was, is actually Newberry Street that has many different kinds of, again, um, stormwater management devices underneath it. And here you can see the sections. So the sections are very, very important in terms of how deep we go, what materials we use in order for the soils to become more open to the environment. Anyway, between all 12 students, we measured all our sites and it came out to basically $207 million just on uh, energy savings. But the other things and benefits are like creating biodiversity, bringing down the heat, um, being able to take down uh, pollution, be able to sop up all the stormwater management, stormwater. We didn't have one drop of water going into the, the uh, combined sewer because we had a lot of trees, we had a lot of space, we had a lot of earth that absorbed it. So this is, you know, this is really kind of the, the big um, goal here is green infrastructure. And I love this image. This is an image from uh, Melbourne, Australia, which has really turned itself into an amazing green city. So anything, any surface that you can actually grow green on, uh, that's what you need to do in any way you can. So let's see. 
So uh, green solutions, again, these are the list of green solutions. These are the list of built and material solutions and also planning solutions that we can bring to these cities. Okay, so now we're getting to our climate emergency. So climate change affects us as people when we hear about it and we feel like the problem is too large to tackle. And often people feel powerless to change. I know I did when I really bumped my head up against it and we don't know what to do and also feel a sense of helplessness. Um, also, we're digging around for who we are as a profession and what do we do? Because actually, we're a very important uh, profession in this, in the realm of climate change, because so many people are living in cities and people like us, we're going to have to rebuild it and figure it out. So, but I've found that the more and more I know and I understand, the more ideas come up and pop up into my head and the more I feel I can contribute. But we are all different and we can address climate change in so many ways, but the key is knowing about it and it opens the door for us and our ability to participate. So currently education landscape architects certainly at Harvard has really addressed the climate crisis through uh, teaching about adaptation and resiliency. Um, however, scientific uh, experts are also saying that that is not going to be enough. What we're going to have to do is really think about mitigation and mitigation goes to the root of causes of the cause of climate change. In other words, greenhouse gases. In other words, how do we get carbon dioxide out of the environment, which is causing causal to climate change? So what can we do as professionals to do that? but we can play a very large role in mitigation. And it turns out that landscape architecture can play a huge role because we are the decarbonization profession. That's us. We can start making t-shirts about that. So Paul Hawken is this uh, wonderful guy. He uh, put together a very, very important book called Drawdown. And he had about 70 different um, scientists working on this, pulling together information about solutions that we actually can deploy now that will take down carbon dioxide. And his goal was in 30 years, 20 years, that if we were to do this list, we would be able to take down all the carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere now, which is, I don't know, it's something like 700, 500, something like that, gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tons. That's how much we have in the atmosphere and that's what we need to take down. And we've been putting that up for about a hundred years. So this book is called Drawdown and it has 80 solutions for mitigation. And as I said, it can be implemented now. And um, it's, it's, I suggest that all of you get this book. If, you, if there's one thing you could learn from here that would be good for you is get this book. It's a handbook. It has all these very, very interesting ideas from old, old ways of dealing with, with the, the, the land to new ones that are coming on board. And everybody in the office has it. Every student in my classes have to get it. I think we've actually, for our, our new climate course, they have to get it. So I really recommend that you actually get this book. And what this, it does is that it lists all the different things that will impact uh, taking down carbon dioxide and he measures it in terms of gigatons. So it's measurable and there are metrics. Now, all these, the, these uh, well, it's kind of the, the five are really dealing with the land and with nature. Uh, the top 15 solutions up here are disproportionately powerful. And these solutions are responsible for 65% of the total draw, that drawdown. And if you take a look at what actually draws down the most, it's, it's natural systems that we've actually um, disregarded and screwed up. But if we regenerate them, it would do so much for our planet. Uh, these yellow ones are all uh, ideas that we as builders of the environment can actually take from planning architecture to landscape architecture. So that's what I'm saying. They're really, really interesting to get these. So these are the top 15 solutions, 65% of the total drawdown. 
And so again, our list, um, afforestation, bamboo is a miracle plant, it turns out, coastal wetlands and, and keeping them and rebuilding them, green roofs, cool roofs, regenerative architecture and landscapes, agriculture, sorry, biochar, alternative cement, recycling materials, bike infrastructure and walkable street cities. So these are, you know, everything that you can put in, in your, your box and take out. So uh, stopping all deforestation and um, regenerate our forests, if we could stop it, it would offset up to one third of all carbon emissions worldwide, but we are cutting down all of our world forests. And we're doing that so countries can go and find tracks for agriculture because we're losing our land. So there is a downward cycle of, of uh, population growing, uh, land becoming too dry or too, uh, too, too salty, and countries going abroad and finding other tracts of land where they can cut down trees and plant. So that's, that's a very bad thing for us globally. So when you add up the impact of carbon sequestration, forest protection and tropical and temperate restoration are the most powerful solutions to address global warming. So we have to be activists and really stop that if we can. So without question, the Amazon was the greatest single natural resource in the world and tropical forests once covered 12% of the world's landmass, but now it's only 5% or less. And the Amazon has been so degraded that it is no longer taking down carbon dioxide be because it's dying. It's putting up more carbon dioxide. It's now a carbon dioxide chimney. That's what we've done to the Amazon. So this guy who is a hero to me, and I've, I, I'm hoping I'm gonna be working with Shubendu Sharma. Guess where he's from? Yes, India, he's awesome. This guy is a founder of a com company called A Forest which creates, he can create forests on any patch of land and he can create a forest in the area of six parking spaces and put in 300 trees. Of course, um, so if anybody tells you there's not room to grow trees, um, it's not true. But he really has been going around the world and teaching people how to plant uh, real forests using indigenous seeds and plants and making sure that the mixture is right, making sure that the soils are right and then just letting it rip and they compete and then they grow in a very healthy manner. So this is what a urban forest can do for cities. It can mitigate heat island effect, absorb storm water, insulate homes, reduce pollution, capture greenhouse gases, create habitat, reduce use of energy, reduce cost of energy and make life beautiful. So bamboo is the fourth most effective strategy in this book for us to consider. Um, it rapidly sequesters carbon, carbon in biomass and soil, taking it out of the air faster than almost any other plant. And because bamboo is a grass, it contains silica that resists degradation and allows the carbon they store in the soil to remain for thousands of years. It is now being used as structural timber. This is so exciting. So the fourth yeah, sorry. So um, the bamboo hall here, I mean, there are many, many different kinds of buildings and experiments being done with bamboo, which is very exciting. So buildings are the biggest source of carbon emissions in the world. 39% of carbon emissions come from construction materials and building operations. So um, there's no end in sight, really, as new construction demands will continue to grow to accommodate population expansion, rural migration to cities and climate refugees and carbon offset reforestation projects are notoriously difficult to get verified track and to prove carbon uh, dioxide sequestration. So we're looking at these ideas of structural bamboo. I work with a brilliant uh, engineer in London who is really into this. I'm, you know, I, I couldn't believe what he was telling me, but it's now being used as a structural timber. And we believe that one of the largest disruptions in construction materials in the coming decade will be the widespread adoption of structural bamboo. As this shift occurs, every new building will support a climate positive carbon dioxide drawdown and create regenerative local bamboo economies. I'll close on. Okay. So, Coastal wetlands, we have to, this is a list of drawdown topics that we all need to think about and deploy as landscape architects. 
white roofs, green roofs, mass timber, which actually describes a number of large engineered wood products that typically involve the lamination and compression of multiple layers in solid wood panels. And mass timber is fire resistant, it's strong, it's sustainable and makes con construction cost efficient and you can recycle. So people are working on negative carbon emissions, concrete. Regenerative agriculture is very interesting. And I think as landscape architects, we have to cross the silos and start working in a much broader scale in terms of learning how the land actually works. And there's a lot of very interesting um, issues to be learned through uh, regenerative agriculture and other kind of new and formulating ways of uh, growing and tilling the land. So uh, regenerative agriculture is about <clears throat> restoring degraded soils by, by um, putting in carbon content to improve plant health, nutrition, and productivity. And by minimizing the disruption of the soil and keeping the soil covered, we can restore the soil's microbial life, soil texture, root growth, water retention is increased, and fertility compounds so that you don't need any fertilizers, which is poisoning us, by the way. Um, it also grows bigger plants. So what this is saying, and what I didn't know, is that when you till over the earth, when the farmers actually till the earth, it releases more carbon dioxide because the carbon is inside the soil. And when you can flip it out, it goes back up. So to the left, you can see that the soil has been protected with straw. It's made with different um, small little uh, like uh, riverways that you use for irrigation. They're actually graded, so they're kind of down. And to the right, you're seeing industrial ways of growing where you throw the water up in the air, you lose the water. And these have been um, planted at the same time. You can see the regenerative ag agriculture, which is doing so much for everything. It's not putting up carbon dioxide. It's putting minerals and um, biodiversity down into the soils. And also it's growing bigger plants. So um, the way we've been doing it has uh, really, it needs to stop. So biochar is a, real, is a soil amendment that you can use in your projects. And it's made from, um, burning wood and organics uh, in very, very hot ovens called pyrolysis, which actually captures the carbon dioxide and you can put it back into the soil and it regenerates the health of the soil. So recycling, um, half the world's waste is generated outside of household and construction sites. So we need to do that bike infrastructure and send cars, <clears throat> walkable cities, but the killer question here is what if mitigation, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> anything. Oh, what about the ambulance? I can't hear it. Sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I just, <clears throat> I don't want to miss anything here. So the question is what if everything we're doing right now um, <clears throat> still does not. Um, is not fast enough to deal with the rate of climate change. So this one really shook me. This one was a little um, uh, difficult because, uh, let's see, I was told just last week that scientists have determined that committed warming, meaning the warming that has already happened and is inside the system, has been uh, found to be, has been measured at 1.4 degrees. Um, this 1.4 degrees that we already have in our system has not been accounted for in the IPCC calculations, which means that we're minus 1.4 degrees of warming in all the calculations the IPCC has offered. <laughs> so, yeah, so, it means that the scientists have figured out that with the 1.4 degree of embodied warming that we have not calculated for, on top of our 1.1 degree means that we will blow past our 1.5 or even two degree goal. Uh, now it's inevitable that we will be going up to 2.5 degrees 
as our baseline. Thank you. Thus, we have to stop emissions sooner than we ever thought. And, and um, this is a serious point. We're all flipping out. There's a big conversation going around it. But emissions are still rising as we speak. The Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf is melting as the Arctic uh, is melting. And it will be uh, allowing methane to go back into the air. And methane is um, a greenhouse gas that is 28 to 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And this is now happening. Uh, our governmental uh, vehicles that we've tried to actually um, pull together, nothing much has happened. And the scientific con consensus is that no amount of adaptation or resilient planning can lead us to a stable, secure climate future. In other words, all our adaptation that we're doing, it's to adapt. But then in order to adapt, you need a, pla a plateau to adapt to. But we're actually on a spiral. So it's not like you adapt to a given spot on the, on the uh, thermometer. It just is keeping going. Um, we've run out of time. We just haven't really paid any attention. The United States, uh, you know, we had Mr. Trump, who was a climate denier. Um, yes, and we haven't been able, actually nobody has actually been able to apply their commitment. So we need different kinds of solutions. We need bigger scale solutions. We need solutions that can actually engineer the climate and turn it around. So hence the issue of climate engineering or geoengineering. So I don't know whether you guys ever watched Ren and Stimpy, but our family was a big, huge fan of Ren and Stimpy. This is Ren saying, what is it, man? And so, uh, it's lunatic climate change scientists are now pushing outlandish, scary geoengineering schemes to cool the planet. That's what it is. But it is defined, actually, hold on, let me see. Uh, it is really defined as a large scale modification of the Earth's systems to address and mitigate climate change. That's the purpose of all these genius scientists. Um, there is a wide range of technologies and practices that are considered under the umbrella of geoengineering. And one cons consistency is that all of these solutions are at a scale that will affect the planet. So if you look carefully, these ideas involve the landscape, geology, the oceans, and the atmospheres. And the, work, the scientific community is working on all of these. So, I just got sucked into all these new ideas that are coming up and are being tested. And uh, all these people, I mean, the scientists have known about climate change for over 100 years. In 2018, we almost, the United States almost went forward to uh, start to um, uh, devise climate change policy. Uh, Exxon knew, the oil companies knew, they all knew. Um, and yet, we weren't able to push that through and the oil companies knew what they were doing and kept on pushing it through. So if we ever get to the point where we can um, bring people to court, <laughs> I would be all on that. That's, it was terrible. So I just wanna go through the taxonomy. You're not, I'm not, you don't, I'm not gonna test you on this stuff, but there are two main arms of geoengineering and the left is uh, solar radiation management, meaning managing the heat that is coming from the sun, which is getting trapped underneath our blanket of carbon dioxide or and carbon dioxide removal. And there are many types of this. So if you see under the carbon dioxide removal, there's that kind of greenish box. That greenish box has to do with land-based ideas and methods to bring down carbon dioxide that are natural. And then there's physical and chemical where solar radiation is everything from reforestation to painting your roof white. So um, these are the two major arms as I was talking about. And what you're looking to the right is a machine called the direct air capture machine that it has been built and is being tested and will be used. Um, uh, the, the same guy at Harvard who really started this also has started the solar engineering, his name is David Keith. And this, the, the uh, 
carbon dioxide removal machine actually sucks carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. And it can do a couple of things. One, it can actually make a low carbon fuel, so it's zero emissions, so that airplanes and ships that uh, need a lot of energy uh, would be able to use this energy uh, and use uh, basically oil that has been kind of uh, decarbonized. So it puts up as much as it takes down. So that's a step forward other than putting more carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere. Or we can actually uh, compress it and put it down into the soil and therefore have it sequestered. To the left, you see all of those uh, yellow lines are bouncing off aerosols or objects that are bright and have a high albedo to bounce back the heat that is coming into the earth. So there are a lot of ideas about that. Talk about carbon dioxide. So uh, let's go to natural carbon dioxide removal. Uh, sorry, yeah, that removal. Uh, and the reason it's under the, the uh, rubric of uh, geoengineering is because it's done at a scale that will affect the environment. So that's a differentiation from doing, you know, your 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 window box and doing a trillion tree implementation. So um, the, the this this kind of uh, insertion or idea really comes through planners and urban designers and the professional landscape architecture. But it's really how we we put back trees at bar large scale. So uh, it's kind of like a program for the Trillion Trees Executive Order. Um, so large scale afforestation is a very, very important piece of what the world is trying to do now. Uh, and changes to the land, um, this is really, really important because it, it comes from the IPCC and it talks about the different fluxes and um, systems that incorporate all sorts of uh, plants and, and uh, organics into the soil. But basically for me, I think that, that is, this is a list of to do. This is what we as landscape architects should be able to do, need to bump up in scale and learn about because this is the future of our profession is understanding bigger scale ways of thinking about the land, about uh, cities, about you know, what we can do in conjunction with architecture and how we really think about, instead of ecology, we're thinking about the earth system. That's a, just a bigger scale of agency that we can have. So what is solar geoengineering? Uh, from my assessment, after having studied this and taught geoengineering to landscape architects at the GSD for the past two years, this is the only tool we have on the table that can cool the earth and address global issues such as sea level rise and global warming. So this is specifically um, aimed at you guys. I think that this is what is going to need to happen to really deal with the issues that the Southeast Asia people are going to deal with because it will cool down the atmosphere and cool down the oceans. So um, again, there's an array of solar geoengineering ideas. There are six main technologies within the class of solar engineering, and they're all based upon reflecting sunlight back and thus cooling the earth. So what is stratospheric aerosol engineering? This technique has received the most sustained attention, but it's very con controversial. It has impressive results sufficient to entirely offset the warming caused by um, carbon dioxide. Sulfates are the most commonly proposed aerosols and stratospheric aerosol engineering is a technology that has been developed since the 1940s when the scientists knew what was going to happen even back then. So stratospheric aerosol engineering limits the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by reflecting it back into space and intentionally changing the earth's albedo or reflectivity, which in turn cools the earth. It's a variation of space mirrors and the reflective materials are aerosols or smart, small particles such as sulfates or calcium carbonates that are put up into the stratosphere. So ideas about using aerosols in the atmosphere to cool the earth came out of scientific exploration of why volcanoes cool the earth after explosions. And the cooling was not a result of the ash and dirt. 
it was because the large amounts of sulfur, uh, you know, sulfur aerosols that reflected incoming sunlight and cool the planet. So the upper atmosphere of Venus reflects a remarkable amount of light, which is why it's the largest, it's the brightest body in the sky except for the, the moon. And this reflection is being done by sulfuric acid particles. We're not putting acid up in our, in, in our on this uh, scenario, but the tiny particles of sulfur contribute to the planet's albedo and thus reflects the sunlight back out into outer space. So the stratospheric aerosol engineering um, actually has uh, been developed to the point of being able to get to test it and to see what happens when you do put these aerosols up just to see it because uh, evidently trying to measure cloud behavior and the different uh, flows uh, up in the atmosphere and stratosphere, the only way of really seeing what happens is by putting st something up there and measuring it. Even quantum computers are not sophisticated enough to, to do this kind of measurement. So what happens is that uh, the delivery of these aerosols could be achieved by using aircraft designed to fly into the stratosphere. And this technique, although having major risks and challenges for its implementation, is one of the most credible. It's not very expensive. It's not actually very complicated, but it can do a lot of, it can, it can really keep us from um, going into worst case scenarios and bias time. So what happens is after the aerosols flow up and they would be put up in, in, along the equator, which actually has the closest, it somehow, and I don't understand it, but that is where the atmosphere and the earth are the nearest to each other. Then the aerosols go up and uh, flow around the earth. And eventually they drop down after about a year. And yes, there is some pollution um, effects we can talk about. But the benefits, um, the benefits are great and the risks are also there. They're big. However, the scientists are starting to actually address the, the risks. So it is looking like it is riskier and riskier. So the only other person I know within academia, like within our area of design is Richard Weller of University of Pennsylvania. I was gobsmacked when I found out that he, he had written a very good art article called Acts of God, if you want to look that up. It's very, very good. So the risks may be large, and these risks are, they, um, they can have regional effects like uh, uh, pushing off the monsoons, you know, having them come in uh, too far into the land where th it doesn't uh, help agriculture. Uh, bad actors, bad bad guys who want to take the technology and somehow use it for dastardly um, things to do because the United States is not the only one who could do this. There are about eight other countries around the world that could. Um, the oil oil industry could say, "Hey, we can cool, cool down the the world, so we've we've fixed the whole thing. And that's great. So we'll, let's just put out more oil. So that would be bad." Or people would get lazy and say, well, we know how to fix it. So we're just going to keep on going you know, with using hydrocarbons. Um, it, it, once it's up there, it has to stay up there and be put up there regularly so that we have a regular amount of cooling so it doesn't um, upset the Earth system and our climate. You want a climate to be very steady. So that has to happen. But if it should stop, let's say, it's three degrees out there, but we're trying to keep it at uh, 0.5. If we were to stop, the 0.5 would go up and spring back to three degrees in a very short period of time, and that would be bad. And then the other one is that who's going to pay for it? They're going to be countries like the northern, the global north, who should be paying for this. And then people say, well, you know, it's unfair because uh, they're getting something good and they're not paying for it. And then the difficulty in terms of its governance, who's going to deploy it? How is it going to be done? How is it going to be transparent? Are we doing the right thing? Is this the right thing to do? That is going to have to come up through academia and through uh, organizations like the UN. 
But the benefits are large here. It's simple, inexpensive, and effective. It could stop the polar ice caps from melting and thus could stop the sea level from rising. It could avoid mass agricultural disruption and starvation. It could stop sea level rise because it could stop the poles from melting. It could avoid the continuation of the sixth great extinction by 2050. It could also provide global social equity, um, stop expansion of vector-borne diseases, avoid mass immigrations and social disruption and save most coastal cities. So from my own point of view, there are so many possibilities for this to really uh, tamp down the effects, especially in Southeast Asia, that I can't help but wanting to support the further research of this. And it's not a solution. It really is just a Band-Aid. And it creates a breathing space for us to get our act together. Because unfortunately, we are just humans. We're very short-sighted. We've been climate deniers. We don't know what else to do. We're not really equipped to be able to go through and uh, formulate the kinds of uh, organizations that we would need to actually get to the, the goal. So stratospheric aerosol engineering, I believe, is an option we must explore. But this was said by Oliver Morton, who is a great climate writer, but I really agree with him. And uh, I believe that this year that uh, th these folks are going to actually do a test. Um, about three years ago, it, it was banned within uh, the UN, a meeting. Uh, because there is so much pushback against it by the environmental left, because people don't want more pollution. I've heard all sorts of arguments. They don't want to put more pollution up there, which I completely understand. However, from my own point of view, it's kind of like it's good pollution. And while people are dying millions and millions every year from the air pollution we put up, this would affect perhaps 70,000 people who are, you know, who would be more a reactive to this. So um, look for this SCOPEX. Let's see what happens. But uh, I think it's an issue that I think needs to be looked at and addressed. Uh, in terms of climate change solutions, there is no one solution. We all have to do something and we can do it our way. We can do it in a way that that's our wheelhouse. We know we can do things about it. That's what we do. But no, no one no one method is a magic bullet. And then lastly, um, as Chandani said, is that we've started our own nonprofit called Mayday Earth. And Mayday Earth, um, the, the vision is climate security for future generations. I have three kids. I'm very unhappy about the world I'm handing them. And uh, I'm gonna be spending the rest of my career uh, on this topic. And then also the mission is to create global access to education on climate change and geoengineering solutions. So that's what we are building and that's why I'm here today. And lastly, um, I, just so you know, I did not go to school to learn this. Um, I read books. <laughs> I just read books. There was no course at Harvard. This is like anybody who doesn't know anything but is not a um, physicist, here's what you can do to learn about it. I learned it through reading. And um, these are, it's a book list. I can send it to you, Chandrani, if, if uh, people would like to read it. You guys all speak English, yay. Um, but uh, I, I've ordered them in a way that it starts like from the basics and then it goes to these different solutions at the end. So. Um, it took me about a year to get through it, but I learned it by myself. So we can do that. Everybody can. You can do what I do if you're interested. But it's a very, very interesting topic. It's really, um, it's nerve wracking, mind bending. But when you start understanding all the amazing things that people are thinking about, it's, it's coming out of science being hooked into kind of really what's happening now, understanding it, it really gives, gives you a charge. You know, you can really start to think, oh, you know, I'm not a science scientist, I'm not, although 
I did almost go to med school, but I didn't want to. But I can do what I can do. Like I, I can communicate to people. I'm not a scientist, but I know that the scientists need that because they suck at communicating. But you know, you kind of find out what you can do and you can apply it. And actually that isn't, that's energizing because there's so much we can do. So that's, that's the plus. The more you know about it, the more agency you have to actually apply yourself. So that's it. I, that was crazy. There's a lot of stuff. I'm sorry, but if there are any questions or discussions you guys want to have, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That was most revealing, apt, and very uh, timely lecture, you know, considering uh, it's kind of scary to think where we are headed. Uh, it is so, scary. Yeah, so um, let's let's see. Let's open up for the audience. We don't have the chat uh, enabled, so maybe we can have people raise hands oh. and then they can ask uh, questions. Please don't be shy. This is the worst thing about being online is you just we just sit there looking at each other. But I would really love to take questions. It would be great. Be and brave. You know what What's interesting, we have a huge number. The audience is quite large. Oh, compared really? To some of our other lectures. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, that was just amazing. You know, it's just opening up a whole different sort of perspective. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't exactly know how much people know. And that's a very co good question. Like, how much do people know about climate change? Because, of course, we all know that it's happening. We all have seen it. We all recognize it, we all know it's here. But to really kind of dig in to find out, well, why and how does it work? And how did we do that? And then how do we deal with it? And what's it gonna be like? You know, you can really make a, a dive yeah. into it. I'm so happy that the GSD is now teaching it. And that's crazy, it's taken this long for it to get going on that. But even at Harvard, we can be really stupid just remember that. Like, wow. so, the, so the interesting thing is, I think many of us do know, you know, the kind of things, the small things that we can do to mitigate. And we do it in our daily lives to the best of our abilities. But these kinds of sort of larger scale interventions, you know, like the sort of in some sense, almost like, uh, uh, you know, high tech, hmm. It almost feels fictional in some sense, you know, the yeah, space kind of thing, you know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It really does, but you know it's what? That that's happening as well, yeah, it yeah. Really After going through it, I realized that, you know, as landscape architects, we do integrate science into what we do. We learn about ecology. It's like the ABCs of landscape architecture. You learn about ecological systems, how they interact, why they do what they do. It's the same thing. It just is going up in scale because you learn about all the, the systems embedded in the earth and how they interact. Like there's the atmosphere, there's the biosphere, there's the cryosphere, there's the oceans, there's the subduction of tectonic plates. There's, you know, all of these things are always moving all the time. And if you poke at one, it affects the other and the other. It's all tied together, but yeah. it's just a larger scale. So, you know, earth science, it's just about bumping up in scale because, well, because we have to in order to both understand it and then figure out what we could do. I mean, this whole idea about um, afforestation of cities, that's not out there. Mm. That you, I mean, you'll find it, but what people do is they say, well, they're going to plant more trees in the parks. Well, that's very nice. Thank you very much. However, what percentage do parks usually take up of cities? Like not much. So it's like people still see green and the landscape as an amenity. Isn't it nice to have a park, you know, but we don't taking the landscape seriously as anything other than what you can put on it. Hmm. But it turns out that we need it because we need food and water and without it and oxygen also. I mean, so we need to really rethink what we're doing. We need to have some kind of 
uh, reckoning with what we've done to nature. And we have to be really bold to come up with, I mean, just to come up with ideas using our creativity, right? I mean, this is really a great place for us, yeah. for, for all these professions of the built environment, because we mm -hmm. are controlling the earth. Humans now control the earth system. And we've done yeah. it by putting too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then you think need to think of the other species as well, the other inhabitants. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I mean, when when you un start to really understand how complex this is, is for example, I haven't talked about the ocean. Uh, the stratospheric aerosol uh, engineering doesn't do anything to help the oceans. And the oceans are the biggest sinks of carbon dioxide, which I'm sure you all know. And then of course, that's why it's being acidified, the acid. But the acid actually breaks down anything that has uh, a calcium content, such as plankton yeah. and uh, coccolithophores and uh, algae. I mean, they're, and that produces 50 to 80% of all of our um, global oxygen. So uh, that's what I'm saying is that there's this chemistry. You don't have to understand the equations, but you understand that this affects that, that affects this. We need to do this, we do this, we, then that's going to happen. And it's it's doable. It's doable. You don't have to know physics. You know, it's, it's a broad brush kind of picture though of bigger systems. So I think it's very confluent with the profession of landscape architecture because we do do the same thing in terms of ecology. It's just bigger. And the other thing that I think may save our sorry asses is that we have the World Wide Web. It's amazing what you can find on the web. Ask any question. It's just pouring so much information. And it's so exciting. And I'll tell you another clue. Um, when you start going through this process, it's a psychological process. We talk about this at class and in our seminars because people are bummed out. This is not fun to hear at all. And it's stressy. There are so many feelings around it um, that it needs to be acknowledged. It, it, it's, it's very, very important. So it's, it's something that you know, we've we've really talked about and, and acknowledged, but it also is an upswing when we know that we're actually participating. Hmm. And you and, feel like you can do something, yeah. Yeah, and you know, when you say the World Wide Web, in other ways, everybody, all the countries have to do their part, you know? So they're bringing the whole world together, so yeah. If we can. It's an interesting part, yeah. We can, but we need to do it in order yeah. to do it. Some can yeah. to a greater extent, some to a lesser extent, just simply because of affordability. I mean, in small ways we can, but to contribute to things like this uh, stratospheric aerosol engineering, I'm sure it requires a lot of money, you know, so. Well, uh, you know, it's it's not the most expensive thing that's on the table, like direct air capture, which will be taking down carbon dioxide, that's more expensive. Sure. But you know what? I mean, we can afford it. I mean, the we have world, to afford it probably, yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, it, it's just like, if you, the problem is, is if you can't make a profit, that's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can't make a profit, well, what do I want to do? What do I want to invest in that? Oh, to save the earth. Oh, I'm not that interested. You know, it's like. <laughs> yeah, um, that's. Well, the whole issue of inequity, I think, is a big one. And if you really take a look at that map and you see how few people have fucked up the world so badly, uh, that that needs to be addressed. Mm. I, I really believe that. Yeah. Now, you know, it's, it is controversial and I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to have debates at the GSD about it. I think it's very important because it's people just like us who are actually blocking it as well. Yeah. You know, people who are very heavy duty environmentalists and people who I truly respect. But, you know, my, 
my complaint is that, you know, while you're sitting in your nice temperate kind of zone and you got money and if something happens, you can get in your car and drive away or you're, you're up north in Scandinavia looking at your second house, looking over the glacial, you know, ice melt. It's like, who are you to make a decision about not doing it? Like if you're a woman in Southern Africa in the Kalahari and you had, you know, small children and you had no food, mm. would you say, no, I don't want to do this because I don't want to put up pollution, which is like a microcosm of what we're doing now? And who are you to say that? Who are you to make a decision about that? You know, it's like, and they, and they do. So who, do you, who the fuck do you are, really? I mean, it, it, and then, I mean, the, the, oh, well, there are too many people down there. So I said, yeah, and are you saying that everybody should die? You know, I mean, it's this crazy, crazy, crazy arguments. Mm. Uh, but I do think what, you know, it's really good to learn about it and to everybody come with their own evaluation. The, dis the, the, mm -hmm. the discussion about it is very important. But mm -hmm. now that we've heard this kind of new news that actually, geez, you know, we're definitely going to 2.5 by 2050. Mm. It's probably these conversations are going to ramp up. And I think that even just knowing about it is a good thing because it is going to have to have a push from well-educated people who have access to policy makers. Sure. I think the underpinning of the whole thing is that we're all in this together, you know, suddenly, <laughs> you know, it's not one country or the other, everybody is going to be affected by this, so. Well, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I don't, you know, the idea of going to Mars just doesn't turn me on at all. <laughs> I don't understand yeah. why that is really so exciting, but you know, right. uh, I think the earth is much more beautiful. I could be on a beach and go swimming, I guess. Yeah. Crazy. Huh? So are there any questions? Or yeah, discussion? is there, I mean, uh, students you can, or anybody from the, I see a raised hand. So, uh, you know, whoever, uh, but I don't see a name. I think you have just, it's just showing the name of your device. So yes, Avneet, please go ahead. Avneet? I uh, yes. Know. Hello, yeah. ma'am. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my question was that uh, ma you have spoken a lot about the ecological uh, calamities in India and China. And these are also now considered to be the uh, fastest growing um, economically like superpowers or countries and uh, how do you think climate change factors into that in that scenario because then you have a lot of um, people like entrepreneurs or investors who are looking to kind of uh, in some way harness the natural resources of the country so uh, what in your opinion is the uh, remedy to this kind of didactic take on we have to look at these countries as huge uh, sort of basins of uh, producers of carbon dioxide. But at the same time, you have this rising promise of development, which is being marketed or pushed. Well, it's funny. Right now, I'm reading this book about China. And it's basically making the case of ecocide, where China um, it really goes down to cultural beliefs and kind of what drives cultures. Um, but China, this book says, is that the most important value is to, is to prosper financially. And I, I recently have given a lecture to China and you saw all those red dots in the ocean along, yep. I mean, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Shanghai, these are all the generators of wealth. And all of them by 2050 will be underwater. And they're going and banging on and putting in more and more buildings and infrastructure. And I do a lot of work in China. I love going to China. I think it's a great country. Um, but I've always wondered how could they be putting so much money into the country and spe specifically these areas, knowing that 
sea level rise is going to consume it. But I, the book is basically saying that they are, they're going, they're going for the money. They're going for eight percent growth every year. That means that they're going to have to dig more and more coal and put more and more um, carbon dioxide into, carbon dioxide. into the atmosphere. And there's really no real rule of law which deals with pollution and putting in, you know, uh, taking really uh, dangerous pollutants and putting them into the ag into agriculture that the soils are completely contaminated and toxic a big percentage of it is the streams are toxic the atmosphere is toxic and um and many many people die but you see that at least within the culture um the culture is such that you basically are there for the good of the whole that an individual is less important really contributing to the, the community that's that's their their vision and I actually have always been very jealous of that given the fact we're in the United States and the opposite but what that also means is that even if people are dying from these things they're dying in behalf of the good of the whole and that a lot you know then there's a real difference between the poor and the rich Poor people in the agricultural areas, are, you know, that's where a lot of these pollutants are are going. It's where you know it's dropped off. It you know it, it's really, um, yeah. Pe people will die because of that uh, of, of those beliefs and of their ambition to basically overtake the United States, which I'd be happy if they did. I, I say that's a good idea, actually, but that's what they want. And they want all the glitz that they've seen, you know, on movies, which is really actually a story about what not to do in a developing country. Like, don't do this, please don't do this. And it's going to actually put more and more and more carbon dioxide up there. They're not going to they're not worried about taking it down. I mean, they say that they are, but they actually don't implement it. So I'm pretty bummed out about that. India, I don't know as much about. I, you know, I don't know what, really what the drivers are in your culture, although I think it's probably much more connected to the earth. And um, my guess is that there, there is more of a connection to the idea of trying to regenerate natural systems and trying to figure out how to do that and grow. But yes, it's a, it's it's still a conundrum. You know, it's like, yeah. well, so people- So India is just um, much uh, less developed than China, for example, and we have a huge population. I think that is the main sort of problem, you know, uh, that yeah. one point, almost 1.4 billion people and I think what is the one third the land area of the United States? I'm not sure. Yeah. But something like that. Yeah. So even if lifestyles are still very kind of simple and, you know, the, the vast majority, um, but just the number, you know, make uh, everything more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I wish I had an answer. I, I really do. I, I fear for and feel for the people in India and in Bangladesh. I, I, you know, it's so, it's upsetting. I mean, I, I know you guys probably have a very good idea of what's going on. Um, it seems to me that perhaps, I just don't know. I, I, I keep thinking if we were to, I don't know, think about how, think about ourselves and where we live as kind of smaller systems, because you can't really do any, anything city-wise. But I've even thought about doing studios about what happens if you were just to go around and take a few blocks in a city and then come together as a community and figure out how you collectively are gonna grow. Because you do need collectivity, but if it's so big, it's unwieldy, then nothing happens. So maybe it's about scale. It's about working with other people. Yeah, I wanted to say that, you know, going through this, I have, there's, we have a girl group, which are three other women who we've been kind of with each other now for about three years because we met at a 
at a conference and we were all like in the same boat together and just kind of having friends who are sharing this experience, you know, this what we're doing. And it's really helpful to have friends to talk to about it hmm. and, and have even a really small community, three people, two, I mean, just hold hands. And yeah, you, you need others to really do anything. So when it, for example, one of the interesting things, you know, I was quite surprised to hear this, but we're one of the countries that recycles the most simply because of lack of affordability, you know, things are used and used and they're passed on and, you know, so um, it's, there are certain sort of aspects. Um, yeah, no, I've, I mean, I, you know. The way I, it is in India, but uh, yeah, we're also great polluters. So, yeah. Well, we, we're the biggest, oh, China's the biggest and still the United States, uh, honestly, I mean, learning, learning about these things in ways that you can visualize in order for everybody to have the same uh, quality of life or as the United States, mm -hmm. it would take four and a half planets to do that because we mm -hmm. only have so much stuff in our planet. And this whole kind of consumerism that, that's fundamentally the driver of China is consumerism. And it's also been true in the United States. And everybody wants to get rich and have all this stuff and have lots of choices and lots of experiences and lots of this and lots of that and eight different kind of uh, flavors of balsamic vinegar. I mean, it's, it's gotten so crazy. Eight different flavors of balsamic vinegar. What is that? <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, and the way with Amazon and, you know, I have a 19 year old daughter and she goes and buys things and turns it back. It turns out anything you really ship back because it doesn't fit gets put into the dump because it's too expensive to unpackage and to clean it and to repackage. So, you know, you try another size, it goes back and it gets thrown out. I mean, we're all crazy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Also, the amount of uh, material that is wasted in packaging. Sorry, somebody's asking a question. Somebody said something in between. Avneet, I don't think I answered your question, but no, 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 I, you did. I don't Thank have you. a good answer. I really don't. I don't know. I really don't. It's okay, ma'am. It was a really good answer for me. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I know. I know it is. I mean, and I know that's a really big question, but you guys are there. You're on the ground quite literally. So I think that what you're doing is really essential to helping to figure that out. How are you going to live on that land and be able to provide? And how do we structure ourselves in our communities? And what do we teach people so they can do it? And also don't go for what the Western countries have done. You know, just mm -hmm. keep respecting the land and not be as stupid and greedy as we have been to actually not understand how valuable it is, but I believe that you guys actually have a connection to that, that we don't, I hope, but I think so. Thank you. We see two more raised hands actually. Uh, so yes, go oh, ahead. Who? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. we can hear you. Yeah, yes. hi, it's Nimisha. I'm not sure why the login name didn't change. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Martha. It was uh, a lovely presentation. And I think as landscape architects, professionals, learners, it's very important to understand and realize the climate change crisis, which is, um, which is affecting everyone around the globe. And uh, being us in the profession, I think we need to work towards it, which uh, you elaborated on very good parameters as to what all we can do. And I think uh, because of the increasing infrastructure, urban greening is, is the new way out. Uh, thinking about how, because lands, lands, uh, the ground space is really reducing uh, because of the population. So to go vertical is the most appropriate solution. Uh, and I see nowadays when I read a lot of news, I see already a lot of uh, companies working in, those, in that direction, which is, again, a good, uh, um, say, like, a good way out. 
uh, also through the pandemic, I think a lot of people have realized the importance of green spaces because that's what was open during the pandemic. Because when the green parks and everything was open, not a lot of people would go to any tourist spots. So I yeah. think uh, mental well-being is uh, really playing the game right now. Um, and I, I hope that a lot of people will understand uh, the importance of greening which will, I think, slowly work towards what our main crisis is, the climate change. Um, so through your presentation, I think you, you did describe a lot of parameters as to what all we can do, what all steps we can take. But are you able to elaborate on what will the first step or what will a step be on a micro level uh, as, as landscape professionals that we should take? Um, so so as to get to the big issue. I mean, I know that urban greening, afforestation, um, sea level crisis and everything are there out, but what will the first step be? I know this will again differ uh, country to country, uh, depending upon what the, priority, uh, what the priority issue is, but will you have, or can you elaborate on one step that should be taken by most of us? That's a very complicated and a very good question. Of course, you're doing the first step, which is educating yourself. That is always the first step. So you've done the first step. Um, the next step, if you haven't practiced or you haven't made landscapes, um, is to go out and make one, even if it's a small one. Uh, it's certainly the you know, it's tactile, you get a sense for what it takes to, to, to build, build and materials. But I, you know, I, I think that, um, I know the first thing, let me just say, and this doesn't answer your question, but it did pop into my head. The, the first thing that when I'm looking at something, I'm looking for the problem. What's, what is really, the issue here. What really needs to be dealt with? And what are the drivers? What's behind it? Real, you know, getting to the root, like what's up here? And it could be social, it could be cultural, it could be structural, it could be climate change, you know, and then, um, and then figure out what needs to be done from the ground up. And it's always the ground up because we're not, we're still not floating. <laughs> you know, what's underneath the ground. You know, you, you don't start at the top of the ground, you start underneath the ground. You have to know um, a bit about the geology, you have to kind of know a bit about the soils, you have to know what is around you, the context. I mean, it's a very, actually, you know, landscape architecture is very different than architecture. It's so different. And uh, I mean, my dad is an architect, um, my sister's an architect, my son is an architect, my dad is an architect, my uncles are architects. I mean, and yet um, I really find that it is essentially a very, very different way of thinking and doing. They're, they're not the same. The scale is completely different. We're often acting in, um, even if they're private spaces, they tend to be public spaces because it's outside and we see them, we, we experience them. So what's the problem? You know, really what's the problem? And then of course, having an imagination is so important. I think creativity is so important because um, you may come up with an idea that just hasn't been had yet, or putting together disparate pieces that seem to, if you put together, that could be doing that, you know, I mean, you, you know, you just use your imagination um, and experiment. With yes, things. I think I would totally agree to that point where uh, you said this profession yeah. is, I think it's very diverse, uh, as compared to <laughs> architecture, architecture, so would be very generic, uh, in a way, because um, So sorry, yeah. So architecture has 
so sorry yeah so i would say architecture has a very um, if you know uh, if you study what kind of building typologies are there then you know which country would have one but i think landscape is very diverse every climate uh, the biodiversity the ecology everything just plays a different role to every place you go to so this profession absolutely right and you know what uh, we don't have the we don't have the um issue of having things that repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat every square inch of the land is different you know you know you can't just have a little plot and then go up and then have to yeah. design it over and over <laughs> every everything is different it's all yes. different it's also connected to so so many other things and the scale is different and our resources are different and our skill sets are different the scale at which we work is completely different i can always tell uh, steps that have been designed outdoor steps designed by architects you can just see it like that it's like they should have gone to a landscape architect to design these steps because you don't put you know a 12 inch step outside because it just looks too small because outside is so big so that is like a fundamental kind of learning about scale and trying to make a library of scale into your own head because we, we're not dealing with human scale buildings are always designed for humans you got a doorknob in the right place you got a window in the right place the toilets on the right height you know this is all about us but nature is not like that the outdoors isn't like that it's not like us so it's actually in many ways i think more complex thank you very much martha <laughs> thank You're you welcome. i think there's another well, oh there's i think so nakshi you go ahead thank you so much uh, it was a lovely presentation and uh, I'm Sanakshi, and I am by qualification, I would say I'm an architect, but I'm still learning. I am okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the field of landscape <laughs> for about a year now, and uh, I, I, re I really enjoy it. Um, my question to you comes from my own experience in being in India and uh, learning in the profession. So the role of landscape architects in India, as we observe, of professionals and of firms, um, is largely within private sector or um, gated enclaves. And, um, but as you um, mm. beautifully explained, uh, for, a, for a measurable impact in the society, we would need a policy change or we would need support from the government or projects that are um, of the public realm and of that scale for that kind of impact in society. So um, as a very young professional in this field, I feel this, the one of the ways that we have learned and I have observed is that an industry institution collaboration can be done and it's extremely important. We have so much data available in our schools that we learn and it can be so easily employed and used by the professionals while we are working. It's, it's there, but there is a huge gap in the actual implementation of it. That is something that I feel I have observed. And so where the researchers and the practitioners need to come together. So a platform or a way to get that, for that to work or for that to happen. So my question to you now is that, do you have these opportunities at Harvard? And if you do, how is it that you implement them or execute them so that we can learn from it and uh, maybe take it forward in that respect, because that is something that I personally have observed. Maybe maybe there's so much more that I haven't, but um, so that's my question. It's, it's a good question. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I did have a venture uh, in terms of trying to bring the um, politicians and city leaders from uh, the Boston area and create a platform where academia could uh, and and the people who are actually running these cities were able to meet and uh, for us as teachers we were able to understand what the issues were with different cities and then they the the, the leadership there was were able to um, get information about and find information that would apply to what they needed 
uh, I started, you know, yes, this working group for sustainable cities at Harvard to do it. And it was actually, uh, I ended up having to stop it because it was so successful, you know, where we, I went around the university and found different people from different colleges in terms of uh, finding out who was interested in sustainable cities. <clears throat> And you know, I'd go to the law school, <clears throat> sorry, or I'd go to the business school or I'd go to the school of public health. And I found at least one person who was really interested. And then we all came, came together um, and founded this kind of working group. And then we started asking people from the city to come in and have conversations. And we you know, there were small townships, but they all had mayors. And we would all always have two mayors come in with you know, a small group of people from different areas within the university because we also now have to jump over our silos. Uh, the silos go find people who in different places who are doing things differently and you'll learn a lot and you'll be able to kind of create a group that you can work together because to work on these complex bigger issues you need people who are experts like I'm not an expert I'm a I'm a great generalist but I know I need help and you like I'm working on this one project right now, which is so big and so complex. Um, it's like Master Blaster with this tiny little firm. And then there's this giant company that is actually able to kind of provide the data and the analysis we need of all different people. But go and find other like-minded people who are interested in things that you're interested in, cross over the silos and make it up. You know say okay why don't we have a group and we're going to really figure out how we can start to engage with people who are running the cities and just call them up and, and start it i mean you can start stuff that isn't there if you see that there's a hole in something that means guess what there's a hole in something <laughs> so then that's a good thing to do right it's just to go ahead and say well okay well we're just going to start this and you know, go to one of your teachers or one of the leaders, you know, in the school say, well, I have this idea. I want to try it. What do you think? Just try and do that. If it needs to be done, figure out how to do that. So that it, it was good in academia because it had some kind of legs behind it, right? As opposed to, oh, I'm just a landscape architect and would you mind talking to me? So uh, having a, um, an organization with the credibility behind it was very useful. But it was a very, very, I mean, we really got a lot out of not only understanding for the school, you know, what we could teach because the leadership is telling us what their problems are. And that means we can better kind of steer what we need to teach. But we also were able to contribute a lot of ideas including a table where you can sit at and get information. These mayors would be able to listen to what everybody was saying. And it was very useful for them. And then, and then uh, I ran out of money to be able to keep it going. <laughs> but if I, were, if I were a better business woman, I probably would have been able to do it or had more time to do it, I put it that way. Because I only, you know, I'm a professor in practice, which means I, I don't teach full time. And my job is to practice. That's why I was hired, you know, actually I'm a practitioner and then they let people like me in every once in a while to teach. But don't underestimate your own abilities. And um, just one little step forward at a time to actually make something happen. Just one little step. Don't be afraid of screwing up or not achieving something. That's really, really important is to just initiate something if you think something needs to be done and then find people who will, you know, gather around and start helping to do that. You can do it. <laughs> Thank you. That was good motivation. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's, I mean, we can do a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we are going a little bit over time, but Martha, you wanted to take uh, questions. Uh, so I see there are two more, uh, maybe I'm people who would, yes. Uh, so Thwara, go ahead. Where are you? 
Farah? I think oh, there's, you yes. Hi, Farah. How are you? Everybody is so beautiful. I can't believe it. Whoa. Hello, everyone. Hello, Marcus. Uh, very informative. Hi, how are you, Tara? Let's see. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm so sorry I'm having network issues. Uh, what I was saying was thank you for covering this topic. Firstly, mm -hmm. uh, that's literally the need of the hour right now. Uh, something in continuation with the what kind of uh, discussions we're having. So something that you've uh, really focused on, how the scale of all the projects we have, you know, that the implementations, the uh, design interventions that we do, the mitigation techniques that we uh, have to offer as landscape architects, how the scale of that needs to be like really huge. Because of course, this is an issue which is global. It's not something local, right? So the impact of the uh, implementations also that we put has to have that kind of a global impact. But uh, maybe it's out of my um, inexperience and my immaturity in this field right now. But um, that's, you know, that's keeping me hopeful. But uh, like last semester, my project was just a residential project, it was landscaping of that. But my focus was more on the materials and how to have solar power. Um, inclusion in that, then fuel it well system, recharge pits, how, you know, stormwater management can be done. And that was just one residential plot, right? Mm -hmm. My question to you is, is it like still, you know, um, is expecting and hoping that having these kinds of implementations in every single project that we do, and, you know, focusing on all of these technologically helpful, like, of course, uh, geo uh, engineering is like on a very large scale, but at the same time, we have a lot of uh, technology uh, already present that we can, you know, implement in our own individual projects from, you know, from the baseline. And is that, is that, is that too much to expect? Because if each project is doing that, I think mm -hmm. uh, compounding effect of it would be something that I'm hoping would be great. Is that not so? No, no, it, it's absolutely so, excuse me. <clears throat> I also think that starting from the ground up, so you understand how these things fit together and produce what you're, you're after, um, it's, you have to start off where you can start off. And I think learning how to put things together and it's also a way of thinking, you know, you're, you're really thinking about what it's gonna to take to make something happen. And learning how to think like that, I think is very, very important. And, um, I mean, in terms of geoengineering, you know, it, it's, it's understanding what all these geniuses are doing out there, you know, and they're the technology geeks, you know. Um, I'm really just looking out there and, I mean, the only thing I can do in terms of that scale, there are two things that I actually am doing. Um, only two things, because there are so many of these ideas, but if I am... If I'm in a position where I can talk about these things, I can talk about it. Geoengineering, I'm just talking about it. I'm not doing it, except I kind of am in a sense because I'm working on some projects that are big enough and there's um, financials that are able to do it where I'm saying you need to put in these direct air capture machines if you want to be carbon uh, negative. And so I've had two projects where I'm starting to use that. I'm actually using some other of these ideas like uh, uh, enhanced weathering, where you grind up certain kinds of rocks that take down carbon dioxide, but they're also beautiful and green. So you can make like, you know, Christo kinds of art pieces out of it. I mean, it, it's all about, you know, taking these bits and pieces and that are perhaps not even related. And it, it gives, it's a, it's a, it's a palette of some sort, but starting off from the very beginning in landscape architecture, starting off at the beginning is, is, is so important. And then, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's very important what you're doing and how you're starting off. I mean, the other thing is that there is no one way of doing anything. It really depends on who you are and how you think. You know, we all think differently but it's uh, explore, it's really an exploration. And you, 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 know, you build up a base for yourself and then you get nudgy and you say, well, okay, well, 
what if I were to do this? You go into different areas and you grow as you go through life. I, I was an art student for all my life. So what am I doing teaching geoengineering? What, you know, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> no, you go with your flow, definitely. Even even the example of uh, that guy, Shubhindu Sharma that you gave, right? So he's he's doing it at every scale. So it's just about like, just implement wherever you can kind of uh, mindset. You just have to have that and probably keep going. Exactly. Well, I'm, I've am i made a bid for this Harvard Climate Solutions Grant, which was, you know, it's a big grant. And I want to really test this idea of urban afforestation and streets, how we can really reorganize the biggest piece of infrastructure any city has, which is their streets. That's a big, that's a lot of space you could do stuff with. And um, I've, uh, Shubendu is, is on, you know, I, he's one of the guys who I've suggested, who I want on my team to do it. So yeah, he knows a lot. All the best, ma'am. And thank you, thank you so much. It was jolly, sure jolly. I'm not sure I was able to answer your question, but you keep going the way you are and learn from the bottom up. Oh, you're learning thank top you. down. It'll all come together. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome, Farah. So do we have any other questions from the audience? Sandeep, what are you thinking? Oh, I was just thinking that I used to teach this course on urban climate a couple of years ago, and I stopped because I got a bit dejected. But uh, listening to you, I think... <laughs> It's also good to just talk about it. So maybe I'll start that again. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we really are like in a, an emergency. That red cord is like, oh my God. Yeah, we, we really, we need every, all hands on deck. Yeah, Anything that is possible, it includes, you know, composting to geoengineering. <laughs> it's like, just do it. It's a good thing. You are muted. You are muted. I am? No, no, no. Hey. Professor, yeah, I was just a, yeah. I was yeah. just curious to know, Sandeep, why were you dejected? Because you know, of course, that you're teaching. It's well, something it that your students will carry forward. Huh? Sorry. It was elective. Okay. It was an elective that wasn't going too well then. Okay. All right. Yeah. But probably try again then. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm the, the architect in this group, I think. <laughs> that is the maligned, but uh, no, quite all right. In fact, that is exactly what I feel. It's a huge issue of scale. We can't get, for example, in the construction or in the implementation, you cannot have civil engineers do landscape projects because everything is three quarter inches, one inch, half an inch, quarter inch. You know, we don't have that kind of a sense of scale. It's a different sort of an ability. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you were saying that yes, I mean, like for the Tara, I think, who said that she was working on residential projects, but you know, you bring the same thing to whatever scale. Yeah. that you're working on. So, I mean, you think of one residence, but there could be, you know, 150 residences. And so then you get to that kind of a scale of implementation, you know, so. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I've been doing this for a while. I started off with putting bagels in a garden that was about 12 feet by 12 feet. I really started doing these tiny little art interventions and calling it landscape architecture. It freaked everybody else. but. And now I'm working on a site that is as big as, as Belgium. Hmm. Country I scale. Yeah. yeah. It's a giant scale. And um, things just happen, you know, things just happen in life and things come along. And it really, I started off with nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't even, I mean, I never really even learned that much in landscape architecture because I was sure I wasn't going to be one. Hmm. But yeah. But you know, Yagnik, this is what my dad, the architect, said to me when I told him I was going to go into landscape architecture. He said, landscape architecture, any idiot can plant a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's my dad, the architect. <laughs> oh my God. But I think, you know, I think weather architect, landscape architect, whatever you do, you know, you carry a, a sort of an ideology, right? To whatever you do. And um, I think in some ways, what I feel with climate change and everything, one of the things that we need to carry with us is being modest, being humble, you know, sort of being respectful, you know, in that sense. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah. It really That's does a common basic uh, approach to things, yeah. Well, you know, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I kind of get the hierarchy out there mm. in terms of, you know, and, and really that came from modernism, mm. a, lot of, a lot of white men, mm. I wanna say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that, you know the, everybody out there are your minions and you mm. tell them what to do and it's a top down thing. And that's pretty much, where we've been for a very yeah. long time but the one yeah. thing about climate change now is that the tides are turning and we have screwed up and put asunder the very thing Definitely. that actually is giving us life because we just mm. didn't mm. think about it we just used it as we needed it and it was generation or right. go out to the beach or something like that and completely did not understand it and yeah. now, you know, then all of a sudden people are waking up like, oh yeah, what, what, where, where are we going to get that oxygen for? How much, how much would a glass of water be in terms of the, the economy if you couldn't drink it, you couldn't get any water? It turns out to be very, very precious. So the scientists and the economists mm -hmm. are really working at deriving environmental benefits. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that is really happening now. And we're working with people who can actually generate that. I mean, it's kind of sad to have to do it, to kind of be able to say, well, you know, that tree over there, you know, it's going to put $20,000 into your value, blah, blah, blah. I mean, because it's a beautiful living thing. But mm -hmm. money is the language of the world. And also really interesting metrics about, well, and this is really why, going and getting in front of le city leaderships. It's like, if you don't do this, this is how much it will cost you in the future. Because yeah. now right. the, the cost, cost of doing of, nothing. Yeah. The cost of doing nothing. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, the idea of not doing anything doesn't mean that it's going to get any better. It's going to get mm -hmm. worse. It's going to cost you a lot more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of metrics out in terms of how much cities are going to be paying per per year, like uh, if you don't deal with what is coming at you now. Mm. I mean, trillions of dollars right. every year. I don't know, you know, it seems to me that, uh, I mean, there's going to be so much migration and what you do, especially people in Bangladesh, I mean, the, you know, they're getting water from the mountains down the, the rivers and then in from the sea and, uh, yeah, I you know it's such a deep question about yeah. where will the people go, and I don't know whether it's starting to figure out or starting to design where people could do uh, go. I mean, it's almost like creating, yeah, like space stations or something like that. You know, where you mm -hmm. land in a certain place and figure out how you're going to rebuild the city and how to do that. And you guys actually take it on as a design issue like where do these people go what would it take to actually generate a community and you know provide for oneself and i don't know i mean it is a problem land is yeah I land think the, 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 you know there are predictions that the gangetic plains you know will cross 50 degrees i think we had 50 degrees centigrade in one area last year, you know, and then it becomes uninhabitable. You cannot live. Yeah. So, you know, you will have these migrations, then you have to go away and find a new place. And uh, yeah, so I think, you know, we're already beginning to see yes. that it's going to be, yes. you know, quite difficult. Yes. Unless we evolve. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if we can evolve so quickly, <laughs> but yeah, because it's happening very fast. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the issue. It isn't that we couldn't adapt. It's just the rate of change 
is to right. ask right. for plants and animals to adapt. Right. I, I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I just have to say I'm kind of speechless about what what we could do. I mean, the only thing I can really think of is that we need to push the agenda of cooling down the earth to buy us time so we can mm -hmm. figure it out. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, that's my suggestion for right now. It's not much of an answer, but there is something that would stall, stall it as we kind of really get in gear and start mm. getting off oil, coming up with new energy. We're going to be transitioning into an electrical, you know, electricity. Um, but, you know, to, to transition from one, one energy source to another uh, globally, uh, Brubler, he's a, he's a scientific kind of economist and it could take a hundred years. To, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to rebuild every engine mm -hmm. in the world to be able to then work with electricity. And it could mm -hmm. take, let's say if we really sped it up, maybe 50 years, which we don't have if we're racing against the clock. So, you know, but yeah. here's the, the good thing is that there are so many people now working at it. Thank God we got Trump out. I mean, they're <laughs> going to start having climate conferences here in the United States. I really never understood what, how the United States, the effects of the United States really does have around the world. I, you know, I grew up there, so it didn't seem like, you know, it was just business as usual, but we, we owe it, we owe it to really push now and get things done. And you know what Churchill said yeah. about the United States? Oh, this is hilarious. He said, the United States always gets it right. It always does the right thing, but only after we've tried everything else. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> after we've really tried not to have to do that, Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the only thing we can do. <laughs> yeah. oh so then God. there's two levels at which all the sort of interventions are happening, right? One is at this really sort of almost sci-fi kind of a level. And the other is these small measures, mm -hmm. small things that people can do to change their lives. And for example, in landscape, I would imagine urban afforestation is one of the easier things to sort of tackle, right? Then... Uh, I'm not sure what the impact of something like that would be at that scale, the kind of problems we have just now, but uh, there's, you know. Well, you know, I think even that's a stretch. Work at the same time, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I mean, that's human beings, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think that starting at the beginning, you have to start at the beginning. I've been doing this for 40 years and here I'm saying, well, why don't we actually figure out how to really have proper forests in the cities? Mm. It's still, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't being done yet. You'd have mm -hmm. to prove yourself. You'd have mm -hmm. to get to the mayors. You have to get to the automated right. vehicles. You have to get to, you know, one of these, you know, billionaire guys to actually kind of do a proper study. But um, there are so many other things that, that you can do. And you know what? I mean, we're professionals. People are going to ask our opinions for stuff. I think what I do now is when I have a client, I always study where it's going to be because we work internationally uh, or you know, all over the place and mm. studying what's going to happen and say, look, these are the things that you're going to need to look at in the future. And, but we can actually address that. <laughs> like, you know, you can shape the land so it kind of helps to protect their investments. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like first the architecture and then the land. Now it's the land. Like, let's figure out what we can do to really um, provide a basis for the future and not mm -hmm. just do what you're going to do. Like, you know, we have a big project in China. And honestly, I mean, this is so weird, but I don't think that the people in China are really getting information about climate change. Hmm. I think that's something that is somehow taken out of 
the newspapers and very, very, very smart people in academia are not really aware like you guys are. This is a real advantage you have. Mm. I think that I think that they're a bit disabled for the purpose of, con of not disrupting the economy. Mm. Mm -hmm really strange because so I've gone over there and, and lectured and when I needed to pull up a fact on Google it was Baidu and there was nothing in there I mean it's like oh my god where is Google hmm. so I think having you know really the education you're giving is really so important that this young generation it's on them that's that sucks for them but yes. you know you arm them arm everybody um, and uh, as I say, jump over silos, understand what your, the issues are that you're dealing with, work with other people, read, continue, continue to educate yourself, don't stop. Mm -hmm. That's really important, really, really important, you know. I didn't know jack shit about climate change four years ago. Certainly not geoengineering. Hmm. Information. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Because I think we'll, we should wrap up, right? Yes, I Definitely. think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fairly. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Martha, for, for the insightful and the engaging presentation. Uh, your talk is timely, relevant, and very much relevant to our context, and it contributes significantly to the students' learning. Uh, so, you know, uh, we are really indebted for your time and joining us here today. I sincerely hope that uh, this presentation will make a lasting impact on many of the participants, if not all. Uh, and we look forward to inviting you again in future and continue to collaborate and continue to learn and educate ourselves. Thank you. Well, Andrani, thank you. Did you tell everybody that uh, you were my student? Did you tell them that? Uh, yes, uh, some of them know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you see what happens to students? Ta -da. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's always it's so lovely thank you for asking me and um of course you know, i get nervous i want to make sure that what i say is relevant uh, you know without really knowing what people know or don't know but um i really wish you all the best i really do because the world depends on you <laughs> now i really wish you the best and chandrani if there's if anybody would like the reading list, I'd be happy to send it to you. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll touch base with you. Yeah. Definitely. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. That was Thank a wonderful you. talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. 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 Good night. Good morning. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good, good morning. Bye. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Chandra.